Today on Coding History, we're going to look at rotating points in 2D space. If you've done some game programming, you may be familiar with this formula. This is the formula for 2D rotation, and it's something we'll use a lot in coding history. If you just want to take this formula and plug in your points and get the result, then you're good. You can jot it down and stop watching this video now. I used it for years without understanding it myself, even as a professional game developer. But it's interesting to understand what's going on here. Why does this formula help us rotate a point? The presence of sine and cosine give us some clues, but I don't think it's intuitive why this formula works. To start, I'll need to quickly explain what sine and cosine are in a way that doesn't prattle on about triangles, angles, and hypotenuse... hypotenuses? Hypotenusi? Hippopotami? Coding History is sponsored by Old School Entertainment. What sine and cosine represent? You may remember hearing about sine and cosine in school, and if your math classes were anything like mine, it probably involved a lot of triangles. I'm here to tell you your math teacher was wrong. Triangles are for jumps. Sine and cosine aren't about triangles at all. They're about circles. Think of cosine and sine as giving you the x and y coordinates of a point that lies on the edge of a circle with radius 1 given any angle. Mathematicians will try to complicate everything by explaining to you that the angle is in degrees which go from 0 to 360 for whatever reason, or that it's in radians from 0 to 2 pi. Thing is, that's just a convention. As long as you stay consistent, you can use any unit of measurement you like. Since we're here to understand rotation, our unit is going to be turns. One full turn around the circle will put you right back where you started, a half turn puts you on the opposite side, and so on. The cosine describes the x-coordinate of the circle's edge at any point during the turn. For whole and half turns, it's all the way over on the right or left edge. At quarter turns, it's at zero. The sine describes the y-coordinates of the circle's edge in the same way, but offset a quarter turn. So for whole and half turns, it's at zero, and at quarter turns, it's at the top and bottom. When you put them together, you can figure out where the circle's edge will be at any moment during a turn. Plug the cosine in for the x-coordinate, and the sine in for the y-coordinate, and you get a point that goes around in a circle as you increase the amount of turns. And that's all there is to it. Now you understand what sine and cosine represent. No hippos or triangles required. There is one useful trick you can do. Say we have a line from the origin to a given x and y position. If we flip those x and y coordinates and negate the new x coordinate, we'll get a line perpendicular to the original, meaning offset by a quarter turn. Normally, you'd have to add a quarter turn to achieve the same results. But swapping and negating is a lot faster than calculating another set of sine and cosine values. Keep this in mind because it'll come up again later. Rotating. Back to what we actually care about. Rotating a point. Here's a point. This point is at 3x, 2y. Hang on a minute, 3x, 2y? That's interesting. What does that actually mean? Well, it means that this point is three units along the x-axis and two units along the y-axis, right? But you can also look at it as a multiplication. The point is at three times x, comma, two times y. What are x and y in this context? They're vectors that point along the axes of the graph. You can think of vectors as arrows that point to some location or other. Vectors or arrows that have a length of 1 are used to indicate directions, and these are called unit vectors. The x and y vectors here are also unit vectors, so vectors with a length of 1 that indicate the direction of the x and y axes. So the x vector is a line from the points 0, 0 to 1, 0, a line of 1 unit in length. We can write this vector down as just 1, 0, because vectors always come from the origin, or 0, 0, so we can just leave that part out. The y-axis is the same thing, but up instead of right, so the y-vector is 0, 1. We can rewrite our point's coordinates using these two vectors. x equals 3 times 1, 0, and y equals 2 times 0, 1. When you multiply a vector, you multiply each component separately, so this becomes px equals 3 times the x component of our x-axis, so 1, comma, 3 times the y component of our x-axis, so 0, which equals 3, comma, 0. py equals 2 times the x component of our y-axis, so 0, comma, 
2 times the y component of our y axis, so 1, which equals 0, comma 2. You can think of multiplying here as taking each arrow or vector and making them 2 or 3 times longer. You can add two vectors by adding each component. So adding these together, we get 3 plus 0, comma 0 plus 2 equals 3, comma 2. You can think of adding as following our first arrow to px, then from there following the second to py. Okay, so we've taken the very, very long way around to figuring out our point's coordinates. That doesn't seem very helpful. And you're right, in a standard coordinate system where the x-axis points right and the y-axis points up, it's not very useful. But we're trying to rotate a point. So how can we use this approach to help us with that? Well, what if I told you that it's not the point that rotates? What if instead we just rotate the entire universe? And by universe, I mean the coordinate system, including our point inside of it. This is easier than rotating the point by itself because you can physically do it in the real world. Pin your graph at the origin with the finger and then just turn the paper. It's the same thing. Okay, so now we have x and y axes that aren't pointing right and up anymore. They've rotated along the edge of a circle of radius 1. If that sounds like a job for our good old friends sine and cosine, you'd be right. Remember that the cosine of an angle is the x-coordinate of the circle's edge, and the sine is the y-coordinate, and the angle expresses how far we've rotated the universe. We also know our axes should be made 3 and 2 times longer. So our x-axis vector is 3 times the cosine of the angle, comma, sine of the angle. We'll call our angle A, so 3 times cosine of A, comma, 3 times sine of A. Now, to get the y-axis, we can use the trick of swapping the x and y components that we learned earlier. If we do that with the cosine and sine from our x-axis, then multiply by 2, our y-axis vector is 2 times negative sine of the angle, comma, cosine of the angle, or 2 times negative sine of a, comma, 2 times cosine of a. You may notice this is starting to look suspiciously like the formula for rotation. For multiplying by x and y twice, we have two positive cosines, one negative sine, and one positive sine. Well, if we add these together as vectors, we get 3 times the cosine of a minus 2 times the sine of a, comma, 3 times the sine of a plus 2 times the cosine of a. On the right-hand side of the comma, we can flip around the two sub-expressions, 3 times sine of a and 2 times cosine of a, because the result stays the same. If we now replace the 3 with x and the 2 with y, we get x times cosine of a minus y sine of a, comma, y times cosine of a plus x times sine of a. And that's the formula for rotation. So instead of rotating point itself, we've rotated the entire universe. Then we use the original point's coordinates and our new perspective on what right and up mean to calculate the position of the rotated point. And that's why that weird-looking rotation formula is the way it is. This one was pretty tricky for me to make. Even though I love all this 3D stuff, I don't actually have a math education beyond high school. So, you know, it's not like I'm a huge math list. In fact, shout out to Freyer Holmier. I hope I didn't butcher your name who made a video explaining rotation after seeing me ask about it on social media. When she explained that you rotate the coordinate system, it was a huge light bulb moment for me. Anyhow, the next video will be about how to get a basic perspective 3D view with Next to Nomad. 3D doesn't have to be all quaternions and matrices. It could just be some rotation clipping and a perspective divide. Anyway, please look forward to that. <laughs>